unlicensed battlefield guide, Fran Fiock. I am in the Soldiers National Cemetery here at Gettysburg. I'm in the Connecticut section. I'm going to talk about a soldier buried in row A, plot number five. The soldier dies at Gettysburg on the 8th of July, 1863, from a fatal wound that he will receive late in the afternoon of July 1st. While attacking a strongly held Union position, this soldier will receive a wound that strikes him in the chest, tears into his abdomen, and he will linger for seven days at a hospital in Cashtown. He will be buried with other soldiers and will be mistakenly believed to be a Union soldier from Connecticut and will be buried in the Connecticut plot. The soldier's name is Lieutenant Sidney Carter, and Sidney Carter is one of the nine known Confederate soldiers buried in the Soldiers National Cemetery, Gettysburg. The cemetery was reserved for Union soldiers, but by a mistake, Lieutenant Sidney Carter is buried among his enemies here. Now, Sidney Carter has a unique story. It was just over a year ago, while fighting at Gaines Mills, that he encountered another injury that was near fatal. But he was back today with his beloved 14th South Carolina, fighting for what he believed in. Sidney's men were attacking Union positions in front of the seminary when the bullet will strike. But Sidney Carter has a uniqueness about him, other than just being a Confederate soldier buried in the Soldiers National Cemetery. Sidney's job at this time in the war was an adjutant. Being 30 or 31 years of age, married to a woman named Ellen with two children, Sidney had the capability and the ways and means to write home often to his wife, Ellen. He never called her Ellen, though. He called her Bet. And you can see copies of his letters, the letters of, of Lieutenant Sidney Carter, and he always started them with Dear Bet. I stop here tonight to tell the story of a soldier, but I also want to tell the story of us and you. We tend to think that these men here don't live lives like you and I do, but unfortunately they do. Sidney Carter's letters are published for you to read, but to me they sound like every phone call that we all have at that certain point of the day when we call our significant other, our spouse, and we talk to them about anything and everything. When you read Sidney's letters, he's concerned about the salt production, how the crops are doing back home. He's giving his wife advice on rearing children. He's chastising her a little bit because she's not writing it up to him. But Sidney Carter is sending letters home. I'd like to finish by reading a couple of passages from Sidney's last letter to his wife, Ellen, who he affectionately called Bet. He wrote it on the 26th of June. Dear Bet, I again attempt to write you a few lines. We are still on the march. We're 12 miles of Winchester. I expect you heard the news already that Yule has been moving and General Jay is at Harrisburg. We're just behind him, falling after them. We've had quite a hot time of it, I assure you. Two men have given out on the road. For myself, I had to leave the ranks for the first time last Thursday for fear that I would faint. I stopped in the shade, soon got cover and a ride in an ambulance for a mile. The rain that evening revived my soul and it has been quite pleasant marching ever since that. We came a different route than we took when we were here last fall, a different way that'll get us to Winchester, which we'll make in seven days, and the other time it took us 12. We have seen many new things on the march. While on the Blue Ridge, a thundercloud passed over and we were up into the cloud and could touch it with a 20 foot pole. We crossed the Blue Ridge at Front Royal, and this time saw the battlefield where Jackson whipped Milroy. We're about where Yule found him that day. It is generally believed we are going to go into the enemy's land, and if so, I hope I may keep well and hearty so I won't have to leave the ranks for the Yankees to get me over there. I have heard nothing from my case since I last wrote from Stephen. Old P seems very kind to me, and some others try to, at least as kind as H, but I will let them know that I am not poor for their acquaintance, let alone their kindness, for I have got friends beside, and I will show them I don't regard them in any sense whatsoever. I hope it won't be long before I hear from my trial officially. Bet, I do not know what to write you that would interest you. We get plenty to eat. This evening we got some fresh beef. Fruit is not ripe here except strawberries, cherries, and the like. 
we could get plenty of those large red sour cherries on the road on the other side of the mountain, I'm sure. Very little crops are planted in the valley this spring. The wheat is commencing to ripen now, and some of the most luxurious pastures I ever saw. I will write you the news as we go on and as often as possible, and I will look for letters from you as usual. I've not gotten one since I wrote before. We expect to meet the mailman in Winchester tomorrow. I hope I will see old Joshua Reynolds while we're there as we pass along, an old man I ate dinner with so often last fall. Well, I must close at this time. Give my love to all the inquiring friends. Kiss the dear little ones for me. And accept all my love yourself and to them. I remain as ever your own, Sid. This will be the last words Bet hears from her husband. She will not actually know that he ends up buried here, according to some reports. Brian Kennel is the caretaker of the Evergreen Cemetery here in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And he always has a way of describing things that are unusual and heartfelt. Brian will tell you straight out that when you walk in a cemetery, that you have to take a look around. A cemetery is made so that it looks like everything is perfect. All the grass is mowed. Everything's in a proper row. Everything's in order. Trees are trimmed. Everything is fine. But Brian will also say, it's not fine. When you walk in a cemetery like the Soldiers National Cemetery or any cemetery, you take the tour with your feet. Your feet will tell you that this ground, it's just not level. Your ankle twists a little bit. And Brian will say, no matter how hard any caretaker of any cemetery in the world tries to bring the ground back to the moment before they disturbed it to place human remains in there, it is just never the same. For thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of soldiers, their families, their friends, and their children in 1863, like this ground, we can make it look like everything is okay. But in the end, American soldiers, both North and South, give the last full measure of devotion for their causes. And in a strange way, so do their families and their friends. Unlicensed Battlefield Guide, Fran Fiak. Thank you.